One of the highlights of my Israel trip last summer was going to the Mount of Beatitudes. And while I was there, there was all sorts of different nationalities. There were all these Asians that were there. And these Asians were, it was very interesting to watch because they had their iPads, they had their cameras, they had their phones out, and they were taking pictures of everything. I mean, their, their eyes were glued to their screen. And I was walking up at the, at the monastery at, right there on the Mount of Beatitudes. And, and along the pathway, you know, they had the Bible verse where Jesus said, Blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness had all those beatitudes along the side of the path and I noticed that each of them they were going through and taking pictures and I said to myself that's a good idea so I started looking like all those Asians going around taking pictures of everything on, on that monastery but as I was up there on the Mount of Beatitudes I began to, to, to recall the events that transpired during the life of Jesus Christ and while I was there having a very awesome spiritual experience, I had to use the bathroom. And so I walked over to the restroom there at the monastery and I got right up to the entrance and I noticed I had to pay to use the bathroom. So at that moment I had this great spiritual mountaintop experience with God that, that the devil came in and just shot my balloon and all the hot air that I just experienced was gone. Anyways, um, that was a unique experience. I did not use the bathroom that day. I had to go, but I didn't have to go that bad. <laughs> but some of those pastors I was with sure did put some money in there and use the restroom. But nonetheless, as I was there on the Mount of Beatitudes, I was reminded of what Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 6. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. And His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. There on the Mount of Beatitudes, as you look down uh, on the very top of the mount, there's a monastery there. And a little ways down the mountain, there's, there's a little area where we believe, the historians believe, the traditional spot of where Jesus Christ delivered the Sermon on the Mount. And then as you keep going down, you eventually see the Sea of Galilee. Beautiful scene. But I submit to you, as we come to this text in the book of Colossians, we find Jesus Christ, uh, Paul, excuse me, is echoing what Jesus said about seeking first the kingdom of God. If you got your Bibles, I want to draw your attention to one word in our, in our passage. It's the last word of verse 18. We read this together just a few moments ago. It says, preeminence. If you mark in your Bible, or if you underline, or you write in your Bibles, I want you to circle, underline, or write in there, preeminence. And I wrote down these three words that I want to label as my sermon title today. Give Christ preeminence. Give Christ preeminence. This word preeminence, it literally means to make Christ number one in your life. To make Him have supreme rank in your life and to allow Him to have the greatest impact and influence in your life. You know, religion is man seeking God. Biblical Christianity is God seeking man. Today as we are traveling through the book of Colossians, I want to remind you that we are, are seeking to acquire steps of combating doctrinal heresy. This book of the Bible that Paul was writing was all about combating the doctrinal heretical teachings of the days of the early church in this city. This city was a city called Colossae and Paul did not start this church. It was started off the fruit of his ministry. And we find that he is writing to discuss the deity of Jesus Christ. How Christ is to reign supreme in our lives and then presenting to the church of Colossae his state of affairs. So I wrote down this thought. The third step in combating doctrinal heresy is giving Christ the preeminence he deserves in our lives. If I could summarize my sermon with one statement... It would be this. And if you walk away with anything, I want you to walk away with this thought. Giving Christ the preeminence allows Him to have the greatest influence. Giving Christ the preeminence allows Him to have the greatest influence. Who has the greatest influence in your life right now? I'm not talking about yesterday. I'm not talking about tomorrow. I'm talking about today, right now. Does Jesus Christ rank first in your life? You see, this passage, along with what Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew, He, he is telling us today that 
that, that, that your spouse is not supposed to reign supreme in your life. That your job is not supposed to reign supreme in your life. Your salary, your income is not supposed to reign supreme in your life. Money is not. The house you live in, the car you drive, nothing in this life apart from Jesus Christ is to reign supreme. Christ and Him alone. So today we need to check ourselves before we wreck ourselves in our spiritual life and ask ourselves this question, does Christ have the preeminence in my life? Now with those inter introductory thoughts in mind, I want to ask and answer this one simple question today. Why should I give Christ preeminence in my life? You ever asked that? Well, I'm glad you just asked it because I want to answer that question today. I want to give you three reasons why we are called to give Christ preeminence from our passage in verses 15 through 20. I wrote down, first of all, from verse 15, give Christ preeminence because He is God. As I read verses 16 through 17, I wrote down, secondly, give Christ preeminence because He created all things. And then as I read verses 18 through 20, I wrote down, thirdly, give Christ preeminence because He is the head of the church. Will you come with me as we move through this passage of Scripture to, to acquire these attributes of what it's like and reasons why we are called to give Christ the first place position in our lives. Look at verse 15. It says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? I wrote down, first of all, give Christ preeminence because He is God. Give Christ preeminence because He is God. Notice earlier in our passage, we find, or excuse me, in chapter 1, we, we observed in verse number 12, it said, giving thanks unto the Father. Notice that, it says Father. But then in verse number 13, the Bible says who the Father, he, he goes on to say, has delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. It says Father, then it says Son in verse number 13, and then it says through the Son we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And now check it out, verse 15, it says, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. So I wrote down this, give Christ preeminence, because He is God. I wrote down two sub-points I want to share with you. Jesus, now this one's a little lengthy, so you might want to just park if you're taking notes and just listen. Jesus Christ is co-equal, co-existent, and co-eternal with God the Father and God the Spirit. May I say that again? I know this is going to get a little bit doctrinal today, more than practical, but, but I know you, you, you all know the Bible, and you like studying the Bible, and I think we can all handle this today. Jesus Christ is co-equal, co-existent, and co-eternal with God the Father and God the Spirit. It says, who is the image? This literally means this term image. It means that Jesus Christ was a manifestation and the exact representation of Almighty God incarnated flesh. Now, I know what you're saying. You're saying, well, what does this have to do with my life today as a 2017 believer? Well, it has everything to do with it. Because just as the Apostle Paul combated doctrinal heresy in his day, guess what we have to combat today? Listen, just a few weeks ago, I had a Jehovah Witness knock on my door. And you know, the, the fundamental beliefs of their, of their views is that Jesus Christ is not God Almighty. They separate Him from Almighty God. We have people who call themselves Christians who do not believe that Jesus Christ is God, but reality check and newsflash, my dear friends, the Bible says in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It says the same was in the beginning with God. And in John chapter 1, verse number 14, the Bible says that the Word, that is Jesus Christ, became flesh. So Jesus Christ left His heavenly throne, and He came to this earth wrapped. He was God, but also man. I like what Pastor Ringo says, I said this past uh, the last Bible study and he said uh, many times in years past Jesus Christ was just as much as God is God and just as much as man is man and he was he was the God man wrapped in flesh I like what one commentator said in the incarnation the invisible God became visible in Christ Deity was clothed with humanity. Deity under some human limitations. Christ in God, visible, audible, approachable, knowable, and available. All that God is, Christ is. 
As I read the first part of verse 15, I, I couldn't help but think as I read that phrase, who is the Im image of the invisible God. Jesus Christ is co-equal, co-existent, and co-eternal with God the Father and God the Spirit. We find 1 John chapter 5, verse 7 says, There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Throughout the Word of God, from Genesis all the way to the end of the Scriptures, we find that God is a triune being made up of three personage, personages, if you will, uh, different functions, but one being, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. He created us in His image. And just as God has His Father, Son, and Spirit, we have a, a body, soul, and spirit. Paul wrote to the believers of Thessalonica to write about that. Why should we give Him preeminence? Listen, because He's God. He is the God of this universe, the God of your soul, and the God who reigns in heaven. That's why we should. But now as I move forward in verse 15, as I read the last phrase, the firstborn of, the, of every creature, I wrote down a second sub-point underneath, give Christ preeminence because He is God. I wrote down this, Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God. Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God. We, I myself, am a child of God. I've accepted Christ as my Savior. I believe in His death, burial, and resurrection. And I believe that he, His blood can cover, has covered my sins. It can cover yours if it hasn't done it already. But as I, as I read this, I know that, that the Bible talks about children of God. But there's only one only begotten Son of God, and that was Jesus Christ. Remember what John said as he wrote the Gospel of John. And in fact, he's quoting Jesus. And he said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. A very simplistic verse of our faith. But I'm here to tell you something. As you begin to dive down into John 3.16 and study the depths and riches of the verse... My mind can't even grasp all it contains. The only begotten Son of God. It literally means that, that He was God. And in fact, the, the Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes and all the other religious people of Jesus' day, when, when the disciples called Him the Son of God, they didn't like that because it made Him equal with God. Philippians chapter 2 says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Jesus Christ is not just God, but He's also the Son of God. And the Son of God died on Calvary's cross for each of our sins. And He rose victoriously so that we could have life and have it more abundantly. The gospel is found in Jesus. He's the only way to heaven. And only by Him can we receive forgiveness of sins and the redemption through His blood, as verse 14 of Colossians chapter 1 talked about. Give Christ preeminence because He is God. You know, if the Scriptures didn't teach it, I wouldn't proclaim it. If the Bible proclaimed that Jesus Christ was another God, or if Jesus Christ was just a man, I would, I would proclaim it with great passion, but also with compassion. But the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the same God that wrote Genesis chapter 1 also wrote John chapter 1. And it reveals that He is God and the Son of God at the same time. So give Christ preeminence because He's God. He's the only one that deserves it. He's worthy of it. He's worthy to be first in your life, in my life. He's worthy to reign supreme and be first in rank. So I ask us all a question. Does Christ reign supreme in our lives today? Is Christ first place in your life? Does He have the preeminence? Does He have the greatest influence and impact in your life? Giving Christ the preeminence allows Him to have the greatest influence. Who has the greatest impact and influence in your life today? As we move forward in this passage, I want to draw your attention now to verses 16 and 17. We've looked at verse 15 about giving Christ preeminence because He's God, but I want to share with you this statement from verses 16 through 17. Give Christ preeminence because He created all things. Give Christ preeminence because He created all things. Notice what verse number 16 and 17 says. It says, For by Him, 
Now remember, we read in verse number 12 about the Father. We read in verse number 13 about the Son. And now verses 14, 15, 16, and 17, and 18, and 19, and 20 is describing the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And here it says, for by Him, that is the Son of God, Jesus Christ, were all things created. Check it out now. He goes on to describe it. That are in heaven, that are in earth, visible things you can see, and invisible things you cannot see, whether they be thrones, or dominions, or principalities, or powers. All things were created by Him and for Him. And I like verse 17. And He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. Christ deserves preeminence in our lives because He created all things. He's the Creator, not just God. He is God and the Creator of this universe. When you go back, you can go back and read Genesis chapter 1 if you like to. Uh, you could be like all the other skeptics and think it's just a bedtime story for children. But listen, I, I take it a little bit further than those skeptics. I believe it's the divine, inspired, preserved, infallible, and errant word of the living God. And if you believe John 3, 16, you have to believe Genesis chapter 1. How God spoke the universe into existence. And by the way, the word universe, it means uni. Uh, and verse, you break the, the word down and it literally means a single spoken sentence. So when God spoke a sentence the world became into existence. In Genesis chapter 1, we find that on day 1, He created this. On day 2, He created that, and etc., etc., etc. You can read it for yourself. On day 6, He created a man, uh, and, and He created man in His own image. And we find here in Colossians chapter number 1, verse 16, For by Him are all things created. I wrote down a few sub-points I want to share with you. As I begin to read further about, it says that it is in heaven, that are in heaven, and that are in earth. How about this thought? Jesus Christ created all things in heaven and in earth. When you look out at night at all the, the stars, all, the, all of the planets, all that is in outer space, it is the divine handiwork of God. The firmament is His craft, the Bible says. The heavens declare His glory and the firmament showeth His uh, handiwork, the Bible says in the book of Psalms. As you look out at the beautiful mountains that our world contains, it literally is the divine result of God speaking the world into existence. Whenever you read about the angelic being Michael in the Bible or Gabriel, that was created by God. Whenever you read about the people who lived in the Old Testament, the people that lived in the New Testament, and you see the people of today, you find that it is divine handiwork of Almighty God. God created everything that's in this earth and everything that's in heaven. When we get to heaven and we see God seated on His throne, holy, righteous, almighty God, we will see that God created the glorious place called heaven. Amen. God also created a horrible place called hell. But the Bible says in Matthew chapter 25 that God created hell for the devil and his angels. So at some point in time, I don't know when, and, and neither do you, and neither does any theologian, know exactly when God created hell, but it was at some point when Lucifer fell from heaven. And we find that God created hell, not for you and not for me. God wants all of us to go to heaven. That's why Jesus came and he died, so that we could experience life and have it more abundantly. I, I like this thought. I had to write it down because I knew I'd forget it. We live in a design cosmos, not an undesigned chaos. The world is spinning. Our earth is spinning at a, a whole lot faster than a Chevy Corvette can drive. I'm telling you. It's spinning really fast, uh, rotating, but then it's also orbiting around the sun. And so if, if you want to be like all of, uh, all of the atheists out there who think that all of this is just a, a figment of, a of, a, of, a, of an explosion that took place many years ago, you can believe that all you you want to, I don't have that kind of faith. I believe that God is holding it all together and it's all spinning and it's orbiting and it's all doing it because of Him. He created it all. It was the divine result of God speaking the world into existence. Not of a, a naturalistic explosion that took place 20 or however many billions of years ago, they say. God spoke it. I believe it. And that settles it. Amen. Give Christ preeminence because He created all things. 
Jesus Christ created all things in heaven and in earth. But I also wrote down this as I move forward and as I read the terms invisible and visible, I wrote down this. Jesus Christ created all things that are visible and invisible. So things you can see and things you cannot see, God created it. Created it all according to Colossians chapter 1. In fact, in John chapter 1, we, we were quoting it earlier, but it goes on to say that all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So everything that we can physically touch that is a part of this world that man did not make, God made it. Everything that we cannot see. I have only seen things in outer space because of, of telescopes and pictures. Perhaps it's true, perhaps it's false, you know. We're only believing by faith that those uh, pictures are, are, are what they are claiming to be. But nonetheless, we find that whatever's out there, God created it. Whatever you can see with your naked eye and whatever you cannot see, God created it. As I move forward in this passage, he goes on to say, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, I'm here to tell you something. You may like this or you may not like it, but throughout the history of the United States of America, the, the, the presidents that were elected were there because of the handiwork and placement of the sovereignty of Almighty God. God has placed everyone there and puts them there to accomplish His divine sovereign plan. God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are greater than our thoughts. So let us not question His plan and His purpose for your life or for my life or for anybody else's life. God set it all up. The Bible says that He works all things for good to those who believe Him. Jesus Christ created all things that are visible and invisible, that are in heaven and in their earth. But as I read the last part of verse 16, look at these last words with me. It says, all things were created, this term created, as, as it appeared over in verse number 16 earlier, it literally means that He is the original source of the created work. So it says, all things that were created by Him and for Him. I wrote on this, Jesus Christ created all things for His glory. As I look out of this auditorium today, I see men and women that were created by God to bring glory to God. As I see the little children that were sitting here, that, that God created these children to one day, if not now, to give Him glory with their lives. But we have to make that decision. God didn't create robots. He created us to make choices. And so I'm here to tell you something today. We have a choice that we can either use our lives for the glory of God or for the glory of self. So please choose wisely. The Bible talks about how if the people don't cry out to God, the rocks will. If the created human beings that God made doesn't worship Him, then the mountains and, and, and the rocks will lift up His name and worship Him, the Bible says. Look at verse 17. As we move through this passage, I, read a, I, I like this verse. It says, And He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. I wrote on this thought, Jesus Christ holds all things together. Amen. We're talking about that, that earth that orbits. It spins, but it also orbits around the sun. Now, maybe you believe that, that the earth, that everything is orbiting around the earth. Well, you can believe that all you want to, but, but I'm going to take word that, that our modern scientific discoveries are accurate. And that, that the earth is, re, is spinning, is rotating, and it's also revolving around the sun. And so, as we think about that, if the, if the earth was one inch closer to the sun, we would all burn alive. And if the earth was one inch further from the sun, we would all freeze to death. Think about it. What holds it all together? I remember my chemistry class. My teacher was, was talking about uh, neutrons, protons, and electrons. And I was actually listening at this part. This was probably the first nine weeks of the chemistry class when I was doing really well because I was paying attention. Um, I, I raised my hand and I said, I asked my teacher, I said, what exactly holds the atom together? Scientists have been searching for the reason for many, many years. But we can't really pinpoint on a scientific explanation of what exactly holds that atom together. Well, I want to give you my theological, yet scientific, yet practical, yet biblical reason of why it's all holding together. And that is right here. This word consists. It literally means 
that God is holding it together. Believe what you want to. I'm believing the book that God gave us and how He is the one that's holding it in the palm of His hands and keeping everything together. Give Christ preeminence because He created all things. Because He is God, are you giving Christ first rank in your life today? But now I want to draw your attention to verses 18 through 20 as I share with you the third and final reason why we are called to give Christ preeminence. Give Christ preeminence not just because He is God and not just because He created all things, but because He is the head of the church. Give Christ preeminence because He's the head of the church. Make no mistakes about it. I'm not the head of Clearbrook Baptist Church. I'm not. And neither is any of the leadership team, the deacons or trustees or, or any other pastoral staff. God is the head of the church. God is the one who rules the body of Christ. And here the Bible says in verse number 18, He, speaking of the Son, remember in verse number 13 it's talking about Son, and in all the verses that follow it's talking about the Son of God. It says, He is the head of the body, the church. Yes, the church is the people, not the steeple. All right? Get it in your minds. We call this building a church, but we are actually the church, not the building. This is a place that we worship God. So the church is not the steeple, it is the people. And here we know that, that God, Jesus Christ, is the head of the church. But as I've been reading through this verse and through these next verses, I, I wrote down a few thoughts I want to share with you. As I read the next part, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead? I wrote down this thought. Jesus Christ rose from the grave. This phrase right here, the firstborn from the dead, gives the connotation that Christ was the first one to rise from the grave with a glorified body. And here we find that He defeated death, He defeated hell, He defeated the grave, and He rose victoriously. That Sunday morning we talk about. And He did it for you and He did it for me so that we could have life and have it more abundantly. As the verse moves forward, and, and by the way, there's going to be people that scoff at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, and listen, you can, you can give people all these kind of signs and wonders. And in fact, when Jesus was on the earth, the Jewish people were asking Him for signs. And you know what He said? He said, you will not have any signs, but except of the prophet Jonas. As Jonah was in the belly of the well three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. You know what he's talking about? He said, the only sign that I'm going to give you is my divine resurrection. He rose from the grave. His history verifies it. We have over 500 witnesses that are documented evidence of him dying, his body being placed in the grave, and it wasn't a scam, it wasn't fake, it wasn't a fraud, it was facts, and you can check the Word of God, you can go back and look at extra-biblical references and find out that Jesus rose from the grave. Lee Strobel was an atheist serving, I think it was the Chicago Tribune, and he wanted to, to do some research because his wife just became a Christian. And he didn't like that. He hated it. They were skeptics at one time. And she became a Christian, and he decided, I'm going to reach out, I'm going to study this, I'm going to prove to my wife that this Bible is fake and that Jesus didn't rise from the grave. And he went all over the world different areas, talking with the experts. And there was so much evidence for the resurrection of Christ. He bowed his knee and confessed with his mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And he wrote a book about it. And I encourage you to go check it out. But nonetheless, Jesus Christ rose from the grave. He deserves the preeminence. He's the head of the church. But also, look at verse, verse 18. It says that in all things... He might have the preeminence. We already looked at this word. It is our, our basis, my basis from the sermon today. It means to have the greatest influence, to have the best rank, to be first. And so I wrote down this thought, and we need to take this to heart. Jesus Christ ranks first in the believer's heart. He has to. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. Here Paul says, give Christ the preeminence. Does he have that in your life today? And as I read verses 19 through 20, 
The term reconcile occurs in verse number 20. And it literally means to, to restore a relationship. And so I wrote down this thought. Jesus Christ can restore man's relationship with God. I can't do it. You can't go to the Baptist pastor. You can't go to, to the Catholic priest. You can't go to the Pope over at the Vatican. You can't go anywhere in this world to restore your relationship with Christ except for Almighty God Himself. I know this passage is a little bit deep, but I know you can handle it. Paul, during his day, combated a lot of doctrinal heresy. And we find this passage reveals to us that Jesus Christ is the image of God. Jesus Christ was the firstborn over creation. Jesus Christ is the creator of the universe. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Jesus Christ was the firstborn from the dead. Jesus Christ is the fullness of God. And Jesus Christ is the reconciler of all things. Is Christ preeminent in your life? Does Jesus Christ rank supreme in your life? Is He number one? Giving Christ the preeminence allows Him to have the greatest influence. Who has the greatest influence in your life today? Father, we thank You so much.